Okay. All right, folks. Um, so next up here, I'm going to give you my traditional annual executive director's report uh, and introduce our resolutions for next year. So next slide. So on, uh, I always report on uh, national regional leaders. On, well, I'll report on revenue and generation save and, and savings of funds that, that, that hopefully we're accomplishing over the year. Um, the one, uh, one note I'd make is for national and regional leaders, expenses and salary, um, I, along with most of our national leaders, don't even file expense reports. Uh, and I'd really like to recognize our national leaders um, even when they are uh, receiving uh, the small compensation we can give them for doing their mostly volunteer work in the association, uh, it far exceeds anything we can compensate them for. So we're saving money for the association in that area. Uh, and thank you again to all of our national leaders. Um, also, I want to once again highlight, we heard from uh, our wonderful uh, uh, friend, a former CCWO of the USAR, CW5 retired Phyllis Wilson. We're so proud of her. Uh, you, you couldn't have watched that video interview with, with Mike Wallace without being so proud of our Phyllis. And she's also an amazing fundraiser. And so she told you a little bit earlier about all the things we have planned, the wonderful raffles we have, not just for this event, but moving forward the Guinness Book of World Records contest, uh, we hope is gonna be a huge fundraiser. And this is what helps us uh, keep the, you know, keep the lights on, keep everything moving up here at national headquarters so we can continue to do the work that we do for you uh, in Washington, DC. In addition to all the wonderful work that you do at your chapter organizations in your communities. Um, and you deserve a lot of recognition for that as well. Um, the one bad thing is recruiting and retention. Folks, we're just failing at that. Uh, we're really failing at recruiting and retention. Um, this year has been difficult with COVID. People have been distracted. Um, but we really need folks as we get into next year uh, to focus at the grassroots level. Um, folks, the, the money we raise through dues, uh, dues and membership in this organization that's what that's what fuels our organization. Um, we just simply can't keep the doors open without everybody in the organization spreading the good word of what we do at the association, um, what we're doing uh, for the members. And on that note, and you can go ahead and move to the next slide, folks. Um, we're going to try and help you with that. Here's the real bottom line. If someone asks you, if you're like a chapter president or a region director, and they ask you, you approach someone, say, hey, you know, you know, can I interest you in, in joining our chapter and, and joining the USAWA? And they ask, what's in it for me? That's a legitimate question. Okay, the answer shouldn't be, well, you're a warrant officer and you should join your association. Well, you know, Back in the good old days, we could do that and everything, and it really wasn't very appropriate. You really should be prepared to answer the question, what's in it for someone to join our association? Or moreover, what do we do on behalf of the cohort? And so at an annual meeting several years back, one of our chapter presidents said, hey, you know, I listened to your legislative updates and, and, and they're great, and boy, I'm really impressed, but wow, all that Capitol Hill stuff you know, it sounds great when it's coming in one ear, but then it goes out the other and, and I, I can't explain it to anybody. Is there something you can give me that will help explain the USAWA story and why it's so important? And so we talked about it at that meeting. And I said, you know what? The December issue of our Newsliner magazine is usually a pretty, you know, there's not a lot going on. Hopefully we've already fought all the battles on Capitol Hill and, and the House and Senate have already agreed on NDAA and, you know, we're well on our way to getting appropriations if we don't have a, a final approved budget. So why don't we turn that December holiday issue of the Newsliner into a recruiting tool? And that's exactly what we've done for the past five years. Um, on this slide, you'll see an example of, that's the cover, I believe, from two years ago 
uh, from uh, uh, one of our December issues. Uh, and if you see in that big red block, it's probably it maybe hard to see on your screen. It's a special ed ed edition. And I think it's, I, I'm even having trouble reading, explaining the importance of USAWA and answering the question why. And that's what we attempt to do in the magazine. In the middle of that slide is actually the inside cover of that edition. And it lists the major achievements of USAWOA over the years. Not all of them, not even most of them, just a few, um, but very important victories that we've achieved uh, on behalf of our cohort and our, and our members and really the entire cohort. And there's the table of contents, you know, listing all the things that are in it. Um, there are historical articles. There's one article that almost always makes this edition, which talks about the big victory we had back in 2007, uh, where we achieved uh, an additional, over and above the pay raises folks got that year, we got an additional targeted pay raise, averaging 12% for all five grades of warrant officer. Some grades got a higher amount, some grades got a lower amount than 12%. Um, and so there's an article in there discussing that. There's an article in there discussing why we call ourselves the quiet professionals, uh, a past, uh, executive director, a guy who sat in my chair, a great guy named Ray Bell wrote that article. Uh, and it's actually a very, a very inspiring article. Um, and if anybody wants copies of this to hand out at professional developments or whatever it is they're doing, you just contact the national headquarters. You get about a thousand extra issues printed of that, of that magazine and, and, and hand them out to people that are interested in getting them throughout the year. Um, to sort of answer that question, what's in it for me? Um, and uh, of course, uh, you can always go out if you're, if you're a member of the USAWA and on the portal, you can actually click into uh, a, a link. It's the Newsliners link. And you can look at the last 12 issues of the magazine at any point in time. So you can always download this and send it to people. Um, but that's, you know, that's, I think probably the most useful useful tool we have for people who who really want to answer that question, you know, uh, for folks, what's in it for me? Um, so next slide. Figured I'd talk a little bit about the, our representation mission. And if you look in our logo, there at the at the top left corner of that slide on your screen, there are three words in there: professionalism, representation, and recognition. And these are the three primary missions. We had a real simple mission statement when CW4 retired Don Hess started this association uh, back in 1972. And those three words really encapsulize it. Uh, trying to get after the uh, professionalism of those in our cohort. We still do that today. Our chapters host um, um, uh, professional development events or they support professional development um, events if, if they are associated with a post. Um, so that's, you know, that's the professionalism, um, uh, a part of our triad. Uh, the other is representation. That's largely what I do up on, up in Washington, DC. Uh, and then there's recognition. And, uh, one of the articles in that, um, special edition newsliner every year is an article I wrote and on our mission as defined by those three words. And I argued that in the beginning, our association, um, basically, uh, uh, the recognition part was, you know, you'd see guys who are retired after 25, 30 years, and the highest award they ever got was an ARCOM back in the day. That's really not the case anymore, but that's what our original recognition mission was. We came up with a bunch of awards that are still here with us today that we still give to deserving folks uh, for the hard work they do. Uh, I would argue that mission has morphed. Now, I believe the recognition mission is really done by our chapters out there in the field with the wonderful things they do in their communities, the support they give to local charities um, and, and, and just the great work they do in their communities. The Redstone Arsenal Silver Chapter, who's a co-host of this meeting and will actually host the physical meeting next year, has built something crazy like over the last 10 years, maybe 120 wheelchair ramps in their community for folks that can't get into their houses. I mean, they literally show up. And I mean, these guys got it down to a science. They show up with the lumber and a crew 
nine o'clock in the morning and by golly, by, by, by one in the afternoon, uh, uh, a, a grateful homeowner now has the ability for his wheelchair to get up to his front door so he can get into his house more easily. And that's just one example out of just, just scores and scores of examples of professional development that our chapters do in the community. So it's really you guys out there that are doing that recognition mission. Um, on representation, um, I will say that our, uh, our association uh, works very closely with our senior warrant officer leaders. Um, it used to be back in the day when Don has set up this organization, we really didn't have senior warrant officer leaders. In fact, we really didn't even have uh, any kind of defined management of our core at the time. Uh, we certainly didn't have any professional development opportunities. And, you know, it was sort of the, you know, hangover from the, from the good old days when, you know, oh, Fred was a great master sergeant, so let's make him a chief for the last two years before he retires. No, no, we needed to be something more. And that was Don Hess's vision when he developed the association. Um, and now as a result, largely for the, a lot of the work that he and hundreds of folks in our association that came before us put in, that we have the marvelous senior warrant officer leadership team that you're gonna hear from this week. Um, you're gonna hear from all three of our primary senior warrant officer leaders. You're gonna get a great opportunity uh, to uh, participate uh, in a, uh, a talent management panel tomorrow. Uh, that'll be hosted by the deputy director of the Army Talent Management Task Force. Uh, and you'll be able to provide uh, questions for Q&A, much like you did with the CSA. Uh, and incidentally, when I get to the resolutions, we're going to rip through those. I want you to put your questions in the Q&A. We're not going to answer them on the spot. But if you put a question in uh, related to a resolution, I will receive that. Um, and this evening, and I will either respond to you via email before Friday when we vote on this, or I'll simply bring your issue up on Friday and incorporate it uh, into uh, the pre-brief before we actually vote on our annual resolution. So just giving you that heads up now, use your Q&A. We're not going to answer your question now, but we will answer it before the meeting and uh, before the vote, either in person by an email or, or we'll address it prior to the vote on Friday. Um, I wanted to talk a minute about the Military Coalition. The Military Coalition is an organization that was founded in 1985. Uh, our founder, Don Hess, once again, CW4 retired Don Hess, was one of the co-founders of the Military Coalition. And these guys used to get together on Capitol Hill and they would have lunch at the Capitol Hill Club once a, once a, at least once a, once a month, usually once a week. And they sort of compare notes. Well, you know, what are you doing about this issue? What are you doing about Graham Rudman's sequestration? That was an issue back in 85 that, that really prompted the founding. It's why it comes to mind. And these guys would compare notes. And what they found was that, and, and these were the leaders of all, like, you know, leaders from AUSA, from what was TROA at the time, which is now MOAA, just, you know, a, a, a 15 originally, 15 associations that used to collaborate unofficially at these lunches. And they said, why don't we set up something? Why don't we set up an official coalition and incorporate it and conjoin our voices on pretty much the 90, 95% of the stuff we advocate on that we all agree on. And that way we have a more powerful voice. And the military coalition was born. Uh, today, the military coalition uh, is made up of 33 major national military and veteran service organizations. Uh, AUSA and us, of course, are members of the coalition, MOAA, the VFW Wounded Warrior Project, just lots of, of, of names that you would, that you would recognize. And, and we are all part of that military coalition. Um, I am honored to have been elected president of that coalition a little less than two years ago. And um, uh, today I'll announce I've, I've been nominated for a second term as president of the TMC. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll announce that, presuming uh, I'm reelected uh, uh, by the end of this year. Um, USAWA is also on four TMC committees. So the way we do business in the TMC 
is we have uh, committees and everybody who's a member of the TMC, whether it be MOAA, USA, WA, or anybody else, they must participate in at least one committee as part of their obligation to be part of the military coalition. USA WOA serves on four TMC committees. I sit on four committees, uh, the personnel committee, the guard and reserve committee, the nomination committee and the awards committee. The, the personnel and GNR committee are the, are the issue oriented uh, um, standing committees that, that, that I participate in. Uh, I'm co-chair of the TMC personnel committee uh, for a hot minute uh, beginning of, of last year. I was also co-chair of the, of the guard and reserve committee uh, but it was until we could find uh, a real superstar, the legislative director over at the Reserve Officers Association, Susan Lucas, and I'd, I'd like to give her a shout out. Uh, she's been an amazing co-chair for that committee. But, um, but that's, that's where a lot of our power derives from. I mentioned uh, earlier the 12% uh, uh, in, in targeted pay raises we won back in 2007. Um, another example that's in that inside cover of that, that newsliner that I put up um, was also in 2013. Uh, actually, our association and MOAA and a couple others led the charge after uh, the passage of the 2013 Bipartisan Budget Act, which, which cut, permanently cut a percentage point out of retiree colas, cola increases. Um, we immediately engaged on that and uh, I will tell you now that that if we had not had that reversed and we, we reversed that legislation in record time, we had it reversed by the next February. It was December when that vote was taken. We had it reversed by February. Uh, huge victory because that would have cost the average warrant officer, just the average warrant officer, a little over $100,000 in combined retirement pay over a lifetime just because of that 1% cut. Um, on the uh, COLA, but that's what we do. And it's that coalition that gives us that strength. You know, I have no illusions that if, if Don Hess, as amazing a man as he was, had gone up on Capitol Hill all by himself and tried to convince 535 members of Congress to listen to his 6,000 members in the USA WOA about pay compression, which was the issue. We had missed out a pay raise in 1982. Um, and we, and by, it took us all the way till 2007 to get that fixed, what we called the pay compression issue. The NCOs got a pay raise, the officers got a pay raise in the early 80s. And at the time, we were not considered part of the officer corps, and they left two words out of that legislation that, that, with the pay raises, warrant and officer. So <laughs> now, fortunately, we've changed that. When something happens and they refer in legislation to officers, it also includes us. It didn't back then. But I'm telling you right now, we would have been a lot less successful in, in, in addressing that issue if we didn't have the power of what is today five and a half million combined voices in the military coalition uh, to address these issues. So, just a, a quick snapshot, a lot of the hot button issues we really didn't have a problem with this year legislatively uh, on pay, BAH. Uh, basically what happened this year is everybody knew it was an election year, even before COVID happened. They knew it was an election year. They didn't want a controversial fight over the budget. Everybody sort of agreed privately. And the president submitted what we call a flatline budget. I think it was a billion and a half, $2 billion higher than the one he asked for the previous year. And the Congress sort of agreed, you know what, we'll fight amongst ourselves about what the money's exactly spent on over the summer, but we're not going to have a big fight over the defense budget, okay? Because it's a hot button issue for everybody. So the items they knew we were going to hammer them for if they didn't address them correctly, pay, everybody got their legal pay, pay raise that, they're, that we're supposed to get, uh, the, the currently serving force. Uh, which is tied to the, the uh, employment cost index. Um, they did not, for a fourth year in a row, they did not try and do anything with BAH. Uh, they left BAH steady state. They did not introduce any additional increases or um, uh, cuts of any kind to TRICARE and TRICARE pharmacy benefits. 
there was a schedule of, of, of things that were already put in place that continued going on, but they didn't do anything additional. Uh, and in fact, we won some victories this year in legislation uh, to sort of slow down this effort to uh, streamline um, the Defense Health Agency and um, uh, uh, clinics that, that, that folks go to. And basically the assertion a couple of years ago that they wanted to, to slice out basically 10% of the slots, be it doctors, schedulers, nurses, uh, in the uh, in the services as a whole, um, we successfully got Congress to go back to them and say, "You need to do a report to us first about your analysis on the impact of all these changes that you want to make before you can move ahead with them." So, more to follow on that, but uh, but but other than that, largely it was not a very controversial budget. So you didn't see, and I've got a bullet here that says, "Please support our calls to action by email and Facebook." You saw a few, if any, I'm not sure we put any legislative or legislative call to actions out this year. It just wasn't that controversial a year. Um, I think we did put put a couple out on Facebook on another issue that's under our service member benefits and pay on the slide. Hazardous duty, aviation and other incentive pays parity. Uh, we did put one out earlier this year. Um, we uh, actually heard from uh, Senator Manchin's office in West Virginia. And you'll note in the resolutions later, we had a resolution last year, which was to gain aviation incentive pay. And what we're talking about is for reserve component folks, okay? If you get an incentive pay, that's for a skill set. You're being compensated for a skill set. It's not an additional pay that should be divided up by the number of days you're on duty. Clearly in, in the law, when it was originally developed as, as an aviation incentive pay in 74, and the incentive pays that followed, if you look at the conference language, this was clearly designed to incentivize a skill set. And whether you're drilling on the weekends, maybe drilling on the weekends and coming in a few extra days to get flight time, uh, or whether you're a full-time soldier, you receive that incentive pay for ensuring you have a skill set that we need you to have when you go down range. So our position, and we've got a, a growing amount of support on Capitol Hill for it, is you know what everybody who maintains that skill set whether they're on active duty or reserve duty deserves that incentive pay in our resolutions last year we actually had one for aviation incentive pay we didn't include any of the other incentive pays there was a reason for that and the reason was because we all got together i got together with the members of the garden reserve committee and the tmc and said how do we go after this and uh, it was actually a recommendation from a very good friend of mine over at the in, in Enlisted Association of the National Guard, uh, whose members don't include any pilots. And he said, you know what, Jack? He said, I'd really love to see all incentive pays equalized, but why don't we go after the incentive pays for your aviators, your warrant officer aviators? It's the lowest cost item. It's the way that maybe we can, we can get a start on achieving our, our, our total goal of making all incentive pays uh, equal. Um, this year, like I said, Senator Manchin's office contacted and his biggest thing was his tag wanted hazardous duty incentive pay. So we're like, okay, you know, and we had a little support in Congress. Um, if I were a betting man, I'd say it's not going to end up in this year's NDAA, but the seed is planted. So now we're going to say, you know what? Okay, fine. You know, we've got precedent in our dealings up on Capitol Hill to expand our ask from just aviation incentive pay at this point to, you know, Let's look at all incentive pay. So you'll see that change uh, in our resolutions if, if you're familiar with last year's resolutions. Um, one of the uh, bullets that we, or one of the resolutions that we thank goodness got rid of last year was no more sequestration um, because we solved that last summer uh, and it wasn't even in the final budget deal. It was a, it was a, um, a, a deal in, in, in August and we managed to get them uh, get both sides to agree to put language in there that basically killed uh, sequestration, which was basically forced cuts to the defense budget if they couldn't agree on on a on 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 how discretionary spending went. All military spending comprises half of discretionary spending. It is not mandatory spending. We have to fight for it every year. And the B Budget Control Act of 2011, which created sequestration. Um, basically enforced draconian cuts um, 
to our budgets uh, that were automatic if they didn't if they didn't come up with workarounds. So we got that killed. But unfortunately, after a year or two, two you know at least one year of uh, on time budget, uh, we're returning to the use of continuing resolutions. So you'll see that as one of our resolutions. We'd really like to see folks um, pass on time budgets. It's not going to happen this year. Um, the conferees are working on the two versions of the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, other folks are working on the appropriations bills, but we're just not going to see them take any real action on it until after the election. Um, it's an election year. But we really, you know, in past years, we've seen continuing resolutions used halfway through a fiscal year. Um, and People don't realize what that means. Uh, it, you know, when you do a continuing resolution, you know, on the news, you see, oh, everybody, whoo, sigh of relief. Uh, you know, the time came and went. We didn't get a budget, but that's okay. They funded the government. They did a continuing resolution. But here's what a continuing resolution does. Say uh, our talent management task force comes up with a good idea for modernizing the warrant officer education system, and it involves building some infrastructure at the schoolhouse or maybe at one of the proponent schoolhouses uh, as part of the talent management effort that you'll hear about tomorrow, some of the, some of the uh, ideas that are being discussed. Well, if it costs money and we're putting it in the next budget and we end up going on a continuing resolution, guess what doesn't happen? Nothing new. Because not only are we authorizing the same dollar amount from the previous year with a continuing resolution, we are literally enforcing what you spent it on the previous year. I could be cutting or planning to cut eight, 10, $20 billion worth of programs that we don't need anymore and taking that money and rerouting it to something we want in the new defense budget. But if it doesn't pass and I go into a continuing resolution, they keep cutting, funding the programs. We literally have contractors sitting at their desks doing this all day long for however long that continuing resolution goes on until we can cut that program and take that money and reroute it. So it really hurts the efforts um, of our senior leaders uh, as they're trying to implement the national defense strategy. So that's what's so important about that. And again, it's not a warrant officer specific thing that you're gonna see in our, in our uh, 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 and I'm, I'm, I'm building up because we're gonna, we're gonna end up going in real quick to the annual resolutions. Um, a lot of the resolutions you'll see are not necessarily warrant officer specific resolutions, um, but they are resolutions that are important to warrant officers. They are coalition items. And if you go to almost any similar document in any of the TMC organizations, you'll see some of the same ones. And it's important that we speak with one voice. Um, so if anybody's going through the, while we're going through them, gee, what does that have to do specifically with warrant officers? That's why, because we're part of a coalition, and this is this is these are things that are involved uh, that, that that involve all of us, whether we're warrant officers or not. Some of them, some of them are warrant officer specific, uh, but in any event, um, move on to the next slide. Uh, we are very, very pleased. Oops, there we go. Very pleased with the senior leader support that we're getting. Um, we have probably, uh, and I've, I've said it once, I'll say it a thousand times, we have the most cohesive professional senior warrant officer leadership team, senior warrant officer leadership team that we've had in the history of our cohort. And the proof of that is in the support that we're getting from our senior leaders. You'll see there that, that one cover is the cover of the newsliner after our 100 year ball. And our chief of staff of the army back then was the vice chief of staff and he spoke to us. Um, we regularly get wonderful, and you'll see them this week, a lot of senior, uh, senior leaders that are supporting our meeting. Well, that's because they're supporting our senior warrant officer leaders as well, and the hard work that they're doing, and we just need to keep justifying it. Um, enough said about that. On to the resolutions, next slide. Actually, let's go two slides, then, or that slide, yeah, right there, is that, yeah. So there's that no more continuing resolutions one. Um, just basically uh, 
It says, be it resolved by our association that it strongly urges the Congress on a bipartisan, bicameral basis, work with the White House to continue re reversing previous trends by not returning to the seemingly habitual reliance on continuing resolutions to fund our crucial national defense strategy and supporting those veterans, families, and survivors. And again, we understand if you want to do a continuing resolution to get through the election, as long as we get working on the budget next week, we even understand if, boy, we made the decision by September 30th, but we need time to write the appropriations bill. Okay, that's what a continuing resolution is for. Uh, it's not a way to run the government. We already talked about that. Next slide. Properly fund our nation's armed services. Um, this one's a no-brainer. Um, what we would like to see the government get back to is is funding and perhaps considering mandatorily funding uh, our our um, national defense at no less than five percent of our gross domestic product. Um, to give you a little perspective on that, um, in 1980, uh, President Carter lost an election because of the at least perception. I think probably demonstrated perception out there uh, that we had underfunded the military. You know, and before we got the pay raises that, by the way, we missed out on, that's the pay compression thing we talked about earlier. But until that passed, we literally had E6s and E7s, families of four who were on the WIC program and, you know, food stamps. Uh, but I got news for you. The lowest budget that Jimmy Carter's administration ever put in place, signed into law, in his entire administration was still 5.7% of gross domestic product. So we had a president that was actually thrown out of office for not funding or not agreeing to fund the military at the proper level. His lowest budget was still 5.7% of gross domestic product. We haven't seen a budget even in recent years that has gone over three and a half percent of gross domestic product. Um, not to beat a dead horse, we don't think, and it all comes out of discretionary funding. There is no mandatory funding for the military. And by the way, in Article One, Section One, um, and and elsewhere in the Constitution, we are the only must do in the Constitution, defense of the realm. Uh, so we think that that's 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 reasonable. Anyway, next slide. Not to beat a dead horse. Hopefully, nobody has a problem with that resolution. Um, okay, survival of the all-volunteer force. Um, anyway, that's that's another no-brainer. Be it resolved by the uh, association that together with its partners in the military coalition, will continue to work with Congress and the administration to continue to raise defense spending and recommend legislative initiatives designed to strengthen and preserve the all-volunteer force, which faces perhaps the most unpredictable and dangerous challenges of its history. Next slide. Support Army Senior Warrant Officer Leaders and the Army Senior Warrant Officer Council. Uh, be it resolved by our association that it will support and assist in any way we can the vital collective mission of Senior Warrant Officer Leaders in support of the Army. And that's exactly what our role is at the association. Back before we had Senior Warrant Officer Leaders in place, Don Hess would go right up to the Chief of Staff of the Army's office and argue for what he and the leaders of our association thought we needed to do for our warrant officer corps at the time. And one of those things was to uh, create CW5s. We got that with the Warrant Officer Management Act. We got at least some warrant officer management. You'll hear more discussion about talent management and how they want to uh, expand that tomorrow. But we didn't have senior warrant officer leaders. And one of those, one of those items that we achieved eventually with the Warrant Officer Management Act was the appointment of CW5s and the eventual creation of the senior warrant officer leaders we have today in all branches uh, and at the, at, at the uh, component level. Um, so now it's not our job to undermine those folks and come up with great ideas on our own and take them to the chief staff of the Army and undercut the senior warrant officer leaders. We worked so hard that our founders and, and, and uh, those that came for, before us worked so hard to create now it's our job to support them, to provide them with venues like this to speak. Um, so that's really what this resolution about is about, just stating that we continue to do what we're doing now. 
uh, operate and support uh, of our senior warrant officer leaders. Uh, next resolution. Uh, fair uniform service member pay increases. Be it resolved by the United States Army Warrant Office Association that it will work with Congress to ensure service members continue to receive the pay raises that they are entitled to under current law as measured by the Employment Cost Index. Uh, we got that passed in law back uh, about 10, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, and to recover the 2.6% in pay raises they lost between 2014 and 16. Um, that is a reference to, so we got this law passed and unless, unless the president of the United States by executive order uh, steps in and says during a, a conflict, it has to be during a conflict, and this is a law that dates back to World War II, the president of the United States can say by executive order, I want to, I want to alter uniform service member pay. Usually that, that's been used to increase pay. Um, provide bonuses. Uh, I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, that the historical context of this was that that, that authority was given to the executive branch, uh, I think following D-Day, when we lost almost every ranger we had, you know, and they, they were going out looking and trying to, to, to create bonuses to incentivize people to, to, to uh, join the rangers. And that, that was part of the story anyway. But, so what happened was during these years, um, we had a lot of of budget battles and reductions in the defense budget and, and things of this nature. And the president at the time, um, by executive order, uh, basically lowered our pay. Uh, we had a, had a law passed the previous decade to ensure ECI pay raises. He uh, did 1% pay raises those years uh, when they should have been a little bit higher. Um, and, uh, the remedy for that would have been for the Congress to come back and say, no, uh, Mr. President, we, you know, we want to enforce these pay raises. Here are the pay for us. Um, in all three of those years, the House of Representatives actually did that. Uh, the Senate remained silent and therefore the executive order stood in place. So we're really happy the last few years we've gotten our pay raises, but, you know, we still want to remind them every year in our resolutions that we haven't forgot about the 2.6 percent, you know, uh, that we're we believe we're behind, and that in future years, um, in a perhaps a, a better budget environment, you know, we still want to talk about that. So that's what that resolution is all about. Uh, next resolution, um, another no-brainer: oppose reductions to basic allowance for housing. Um, if we don't have another attempt at this, this will probably get taken out of our resolutions next year. But for th th for three years in a row, a few years back, um, we had we had to fight uh, a couple different flavors of reductions to the basic allowance for housing. That's why it's still in there. But for the last for the last four budgets, uh, if you include this one, we haven't had to have that battle. Hopefully, we won't. Um, so maybe that. Maybe next year that resolution can come out, but for now we want to leave it in there. Um, next uh, resolution, uh, adequately fund retirements of the future force. Be it resolved, the United States Army Warrant Office Association that it will work with Congress to increase the government's TSB contribution to the level originally recommended by the Military Compensation Retirements Modernization Commission, that's the MCRC, so this was a few years back. Um, and work to correct the unfair disparity imposed on reserve service conducted in exchange for retirement po points. That's basically flagpole reserve duty um, and closely monitor the impact of the system on the all volunteer force moving forward. Because we think, you know, when, when we don't compensate folks fairly, um, that's actually a, a, becomes a recruiting and retention problem for the services. Um, so what basically happened, everybody probably knows this, is a few years back, we input the blended retirement system. Um, basically, we cut the defined benefit portion of a retiring individual's uh, retirement pay by 20%, <clears throat> but in exchange for that, we gave folks a TSP match. The TSP match that was put in the final legislation was actually 1% lower than what the MCRMC recommended. 
uh, and we think that that needs to be added back because it's it's we think it's too hard for people to get to where they would have been if they had just left the defined benefit retirement plan in place for the average person to get there with TSP contributions. Also, if you're just doing reserve duty, the, the last sentence there for uh, for retirement points, if you're a reservist, well, you're basically doing it for 20% less because you're not making any money and getting a TSP match anyway. So that's, that's the explanation for that resolution. Um, next resolution, uh, provide complete concurrent receipt of military retirement and VA disability compensation. So if you retire, in short, if you retire, uh, when they set up the disability system, they couldn't afford to fund it. Um, so if you retired back in the day when they set it up, they said, well, we can't pay you an actual addition to your retirement, but we're going to take, okay, if you're 30% disabled, we'll take away 30% of your retirement pay and give it back to you tax-free. So you'll at least get something for this in the meantime while we figure out how to fund this program. If you're 60% disabled, we'll take away 60% of your pay and give it back to you tax-free. Then uh, about, uh, well, a little more than a decade ago, we at least got 50% disability and above funded is what we call concurrent receipt. In other words, we're not going to take your money back and give it back to you tax-free. We're going to give you your retirement check. It's going to be taxable, but we're also going to pay you for your disability if you are 50% disabled or higher. The same, take your money back and give it back to you tax-free will be in effect for anybody who's below 50% disabled. And so we're trying to get the other 50%, basically. That's what this resolution's about. And we're trying to also get it for people who are medically retired. They don't get it. They don't get concurrent receipt. So we want to make sure we fix these, these issues. And we're getting closer and closer every year. Um, last year, it was the Survivor Benefit Program to get rid of the widow's tax. I'm not even going to get into explaining that. I only mention it because it took us literally the entire time the TMC has existed. That's been a goal since 1985. We finally got it last year. So folks, we will get this. We're just not going to get it this year. We're just going to keep keep fighting on it. We keep getting more and more legislators that are signing on year after year. Support for it is, 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 is growing. This is sort of how we do it. Okay. We just keep working at something and working at something. And, um, it took us 25 years to fix pay compression for warrant officers, put it that way. Um, next resolution, oppose TRICARE beneficiary cost increases. Um, again, like I said, we didn't have any problems with this this year. Uh, but it has been a target for years and years and years, for over the last 10 years. Um, it, it seems to be the pot that people go to to try and get money where they can't get it elsewhere in the defense budget. And, you know, so that's going to stay in as a resolution um, is to, you know, to keep TRICARE cost increases, not have them. So next resolution. <clears throat> That's a corollary to it. Opposed Tricare pharmaceutical cost increases. Um, yes, you are going to see the cost of your drugs go up. I think this year because it was every two years. But that's a schedule that was passed three or four years ago. Um, and by the way, on the other item, for those of you who are retirees, please read the August newsliner if you're upset because um, they've put in and they have they've put in um, a uh, annual enrollment fee for uh, TRICARE Select, which we all used to know of as TRICARE Standard, didn't have an enrollment fee, fee forever. Well, they just put one in, $300 a family, $150 per an individual per annum. Um, that was passed uh, back in NDAA 2017. Read the article in the August newsliner. If, if you're a non-member uh, logging into this meeting, send me an email, I'll send you a copy of that magazine, and you can see the real fight we had. They were actually trying to get rid of TRICARE as we know it. Um, what we settled for was, you know, it just, I mean, you would have ended up with something like the, the federal civilian medical plan. It would have cost you thousands of dollars. So anyway, I'm not gonna discuss that at length here. We don't have time. I only got about four minutes left. Um, but 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 if you if you need me to just email me I'll shoot you a copy of that 
August Newsliner. It'll tell you everything you want to know about that, that TRICARE Select issue and the battle we fought um, as a coalition. Um, but it's important to leave that resolution in. Uh, next resolution, adequate funding and appropriate uh, management flexibility for the Department of Veterans Affairs. This is one we've been, we've been chipping at over the years. Uh, and we really started working on it in earnest back in uh, actually the Obama administration um, because, you know, a lot of the problems that we dealt with in, the, in, in, in these intervening years, um, so not all of them, but some of them could have been solved if we had given more leeway. And this is really the crux of this. Yeah, we want adequate funding, but we also want the VA secretary not to get so much money that's earmarked that's you know basically you you will spend this money on this but give him a lot of the same authority that we give a lot of the uniform services um to repurpose money uh that perhaps isn't being used elsewhere into something they really need it so that's that's what's behind this resolution aside from just the just the uh, uh the plea for adequate funding is um you know, give the VA secretary a little more leeway. And and they have chipped away at, at, at a lot of the controls over the years. So it's getting better, but we're not done. Um, next resolution, uh, provide equivalent benefits to all services serving on active duty orders. Um, be it resolved that uh, while USAWA applauds the efforts of lawmakers and executive branch to fix existing benefits, inequities in mobilization of RC service members, it urges the Congress to pass legislation ensuring <clears throat> equity of benefits for all RC service members deployed in any active duty status such that they are not excluded from receiving the same benefits as those serving in active components. This was a real issue a few years ago. Uh, they created a whole new mobilization authority under 12304B. I'm not gonna bore you with it, but basically the bottom line was you could basically mobilize reserve soldiers and not give them any GI Bill benefits, not even give them uh, 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 pre and post mobilization healthcare benefits for their family, like traditional, uh, like as if they were traditionally mobilized, like to Iraq under this special set of orders. And we mobilized over 100,000 people this way. Um, there were a lot of benefits they didn't get. They didn't get uh, retirement credit, early retirement credit that they would have would have gotten if they were just mobilized under a different different line of the code. Um, we fixed most of that. Um, the last little pieces that we, we need to get after, we need to wait and see because right now they're basically overhauling the, the different uh, mobilization statuses. Uh, so we're going from like over 30 different ways that you can mobilize reserve components, most of which apply to the National Guard, not, not, not the Army Reserve, by the way. A lot of these are, are peculiar statutes. And they're going to try and boil them down to six. And we're hoping we're going to see that in the next year, maybe the next two years. Then maybe, you know, because they keep promising they're going to solve the rest of it, like the retirement points piece and all this other stuff. They're going to, oh, we're, you know, we're going to fix that with this mobilization, but we need to get after it. So it needs to stay as a resolution until we resolve it. Um, next resolution, we already talked about this, the aviation incentive and hazardous duty incentive pays to reserve component service members. I'm not gonna belabor this point. I talked about it earlier in the briefing, but that's the change. Last year, uh, if you're familiar with our resolutions, it just said aviation incentive pays. We've expanded it to include hazardous duty and we're gonna go after all the other incentive pays too. And hopefully in the future, other areas where we need to implement incentive pays, it'll be easier to, 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 uh, to address those. And some of those may even be being addressed by the talent management folks. Um, we may or may not hear about that tomorrow. Um, last one, uh, institution of compulsory national service obligation. Um, this one was actually a grassroots one that was developed at one of our meetings and everybody unanimously voted on it. And in short, we're not saying bring back the draft, but a plurality of our members two meetings ago and then again last year said they liked the idea of some sort of national service being instituted for two years picture uh, a veteran for, in your mind this person was a marine or an air i think chris wallace is interested in that resolution 
Um, anyway, for folks between the ages of 18 and 26 years. Um, other than that, next slide, last slide, because we're not going to go to the other one. Um, just a question I'll leave you with, uh, another plug for membership. Um, who will advocate for us when our service organizations are gone? Folks, our numbers dwindled over the last year. If you appreciate what the association does at the chapter level, if you appreciate what we try and do for you up in Capitol Hill, um, please consider joining this association. Please consider joining other military service organizations that serve you because membership is our lifeblood. If you join USAWA, you're automatically a member of AUSA, another fine organization. But please consider supporting your military service organizations. And on that note, I'm going to get off the stand because I have to help moderate our marvelous financial planning panel. I can already see my friend Peter Radvani on the screen. So thanks.